Hello, 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 hello. Welcome. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, to Saber Academy Online. Um, here we are again, um, another week, and uh, more to do, uh, as it were. So, um, uh, hello to everybody in the uh, in the chat. Bon bon. Guten Abend. Wherever else you're from. Welcome. Uh, let's do... Uh, a little stuff today. So um, today we will be going over uh, everybody's favorites, and uh, of course mine too, um, Ataru. Um, the uh, the formula that we do for Ataru um, is paired with what we did last week with uh, um, Sarisu. So basically we're using the same type of concepts and now we're turning it to offense, to power, to, you know, that kind of thing. Um, now, the reason I like this form a lot is because um, what it allows us to do is take very large ideas and things and turn them and, and, and contract them into small moments that then become very useful for what we do in, in Saber Ring um, and from a training point of view. Now with the introduction of the ASL rule set, we have the opportunity now to take a lot of the um, more abstract pieces of things like Ataru and, and that kind of thing. and um, apply them to a competitive and uh, a resisting opponent. So, um, whereas before we would always have to make this very large uh, caveat saying that this is not necessarily what you're going to look like when you do it with another person. Um, but we'll also go by and talk about how, um, you know, where, where all this kind of, all these ideas come from. Um, because there's a lot of ideas that go around about Atari, from canon, from the video games, from this, that, and the other, um, that uh, we can retcon and make some sort of sense, and so there's others that are obviously, they, they don't match. Um, they don't go with the set, as it were. Um, so, anyway, just like last week we were talking about Seresu, people say that it is completely defensive. Um, there's nothing with a weapon that you can do that is completely defensive, that is absolutely all up to your particular um, attitude at the time, as it were. But, um, so there's nothing, you know, inherent about all that. So any hoot. Um, back to Ataru. Now, Ataru, um, like we said, is based upon the same sort of concepts as Seresu, but now we're kind of applying them differently. And the way we're applying them differently is with to the body. So we're taking what we've been using with with the saber, right? Spinning it, turning it, moving it around, right? To to arrive at certain places around our bodies to affect parries and, and defensive actions and that kind of thing. Um, well, now we're going to apply those concepts here to the body. Um, as you see, we've kind of been moving from weapon into the body. You start out in Chicho, where you are basically looking at the two things as two separate things. You've got your weapon, you've got your body. You put them together, here's what you do. You're using the saber to come through here like this. We're making our cuts. We're using two hands to connect it to our body. All that. You get into Makashi. You can just form two, and now everything is out in front of you, right? Out, out at the tip, right, of our of our saber. Right? And we're, we're moving it around. We're trying to keep people, you know, from there. You know, then when we're racing, we start moving that around our body and stuff like that. And now we have to start to include the arm, the shoulder, the waist, the hip, right, and all of that. Well, now we're going full boat, right? We're going to take these things with the body. And we're going to apply them. Um, that being said, <clears throat> because we're going to be using so much of the body, we will not be 
putting a lot into the saber. So this is something that's very, very important. We need to be coordinating our saber. We, we, we don't want to be swinging it kind of out of time with everything else. When we're rotating our body, we need our saber to be there. What that's going to feel like to people who are not familiar with it is it's going to feel like you're not moving your saber, okay? Because you have to keep it um, still relative to your body. So I can't change the angle of my shoulder joint, right, until I get the coordination to arrive in this position. Once I get that coordination, then I can add a movement in there so that I know that I'm going to arrive at the same time. And these extra movements tend to be what we use to um, time our particular attacks with power. Because um, the, the dynamic when we're swinging the saber is that you are relaxed until the moment you have impact um, and so that you can change and all of that. So you need to be able to, to um, create power instantly from almost any angle. So, how do you do this? This is, this is where the formula comes in. So, um, the core of this formula, and the one, the one aspect we'll be talking about today, there's other aspects of it, and we'll, we'll touch on those, but, but we'll get to it here in a sec, um, is the Suma in, in, in Star Wars parlance, the Suma rotations. Now, the Suma are supposedly these, these, these ro rotating exercises. They correspond, coincidentally, or maybe not, um, with something we call the planes of motion in the body, if we're talking about that. They also co co uh, 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 um, coordinate to the three dimensions of space. Right, you've got your vertical, you've got your horizontal, you've got your, your X, Y, and Z axis, essentially, is what we're talking about here. But where it comes into what we do is that we have planes of motion in our body which correspond to these summa rotations. So if we take a look at it, <clears throat> what we have is the frontal plane, which is which bisects the body from front to back, and goes down through the ear, spine, all of that kind of thing. That's the red, or uh, that's the blue plane that you see there. Okay. You then have your um, <clears throat> your uh, you can call it, it's the sagittal or the longitudinal plane, um, which goes down the middle and bisects you into two halves, right and left. Okay. And that's the uh, red plane you see there. Now, you also have the green plane, which is the transverse plane, right? And this motion is talking about the rotation around that axis, okay? So that's what these, mo these, these planes of motion are. Now, they, they show them usually as rectangles, but really what we should do is we should see these as circles, right? So when the, the frontal plane is the whole plane of motion that is around your body, okay? And then you have different circles of joint mobility which fill out that plane, right? And moving along that plane is, is, is one thing. Now, if we look at the summa next, right, we have the ensuma, which would correspond to the frontal plane, right? We have the jongsuma, which would uh, correspond to the uh, horizontal or the, the, uh, the sagittal plane, or the tonsuma to the sa sagittal plane, and then the jongsuma to the uh, transverse plane, okay? So you see these rotations, right? These are the ways that your body can move, that your body can rotate. Now, you might be wondering what that yellow plane is, and that has to do with your limbs, because you can move both, oh, both of your limbs up along that plane as well, as, long, as well as moving your body. Okay. Now, different things in your joints 
whether they be flexion, which is the re reducing of the angle of a joint, or extension, which is increasing it, right, through those planes of motion, right? So that's how we would, in sports science, uh, describe a movement. We could describe any type of human movement, no matter how complicated, using these ideas, right? Because we know that these are the limitations of this. We can say what angles they're moving in these planes, what joints are contributing, what amount of motion, yada, 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 yada. Um, now, to <laughs> most people, it's gobbledygook. Who knows what any of that means, right? But to researchers and to people who are looking at this type of data, it gives us a lot of information on how we move, uh, what we can do to improve our movement, how we can do... Um, um, uh, increase our performance in whatever we're doing okay so that's really the core of Ataru right? using these and then they get split up into these other things like jumps you know and we have the different jumps the hops the, the skips all that's all that stuff is in there um, and in all of that so um, now the traditional martial arts base that this that I am taking this from is from an art, a Chinese art called ditong. Ditong means to to basically lie on the ground, and it's 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 a system of of ground rolling or um, uh, 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 basically groundwork. Right now, not necessarily wrestling. Um, there there is some stuff that you can apply in a wrestling jiu-jitsu kind of thing. This is more talking about the act of falling and getting back up again and defending yourself from a from a down position. So there's there's a lot of that kind of stuff there. But it's concerned with um, and it has a lot of acrobatics in it. I'll place some some uh, uh, links in in the description here after the uh, after the class so people can go check it out. Um, but it's a it's spectacular um, <laughs> martial art to see demonstrated. Um, people jumping very very high in the air and and falling flat on their back um, and and uh, bouncing off of their head across the the, the flips across the, the I mean just really incredible stuff. Um, now, granted, you cannot do that martial art for but a small window in your life um, and then you have to retire and teach somebody else how to do it um, but still the concepts are there now where the concepts kind of come in are the uh, with, if we if we put them with the sumo is um, we have some basic movements that are done in the tongue uh, first one is the somersault the somersault would correspond to tongue sumo that is basically flipping or spinning or rolling this way All right okay we then have cartwheels which are these right which correspond to ensuma so that's where where this kind of comes from right? um and then we have spins right which is the transverse plane okay taking these three things together and combining them in different ways is where you get these spectacular flips and tricks and you know all of that kind of thing and that's how you understand your movement um, the, the the advantage of detong is it gets you moving in truly three dimensions because now you're moving vertically um, which you don't usually move a lot in training at all right so you're constantly falling down getting back up again and, and trying to you know um, um, figure out from from a position that I fall in like this which are the ways that I can return to my feet um, the quickest without opening myself up to attack assuming that my opponent is X place um, so that's the kind of thing um, <clears throat> so um, yeah so that's all of that's where that is kind of coming from now just like Ditan Ataru is associated with lots of acrobatics right and most often associated with yoda now why would it be associated with such a small character it makes a certain amount of sense because if you are very very small you would need to use every trick in the book to increase the amount of energy that you were putting out towards your target because you don't have a lot of mass to start with 
you're going to have to make up with that mass in acceleration, right? To to hit harder, to, to, to do that. Even if you're very, very small, even the act of getting your weapon to move across the center line of your opponent may be, depending on how big your opponent is, may be a, a consideration. These, of course, are considerations that are more apt to a sci-fi world because um, most human beings fall within a fairly narrow range of of uh, body types and sizes. We don't have anybody walking around at 15 feet um, or, <laughs> or the equivalent um, you know, of that. But we do have people um, with size differences, you know, similar to, say, a Yoda or whatever. No, Yoda's using magic and, you know, that kind of thing, too. So we have to keep that in mind. But anyway, it still sort of makes some sort of, as I said, some of the stuff you can retcon, some other stuff you can't. Okay, now what's the other thing that is associated with is Kui Gong Jin. Kui Gong Jin does not do any of those flippy moves. In fact, in fact, he's a very, very large man, right? And in The Phantom Menace, he's not particularly graceful. Um, that's fine. That's, I mean, that's me. I'm not particularly graceful either, as, as people can plainly see from my videos. But having good mechanics and stuff like that makes up for it. Right, so if you are a very large person versus a very small person, these concepts do not have to be applied through acrobatics. You do not have to add a whole lot to these movements to make them powerful, to make them meaningful, right? Because you have a lot of mass behind you, right? And if you follow these principles, you are moving your mass through the weapon and through the target. A jump is you're moving your mass and you're not stopping it and it's just flowing out and since there's nothing since there is no target for that energy to go into you're allowing it to carry your body up and that's essentially a jump we'll get to that in a moment okay so anyway what we'll be doing here obviously because we're in close quarters is we'll be doing the Qui-Gon Jinn version of Atar but this is the most useful and obviously the most um, applicable to what we do because we don't have special effects we don't have stunt doubles we can't do the Darth Maul butterfly twists you know on a moment's notice even he can't in an in a free fight I mean because it's just too you know it's, anyway we'll move on um, Maybe we could do that with the ASL, though. So that's where I'm coming from on, on that kind of thing. So let's get to it, shall we? I will try to keep the feet in the shot as much as I can. But sometimes that may not be possible. Okay, so we're going to start here. Um, we'll just start with a little, with a little warm-up um, of the basic... Uh, movement points here. Okay, so the first one, let's, first one en suma is going to be this. Now, what I'm not doing, and if you want to, people who like doing this, do it reverse grip and you're going to be able to do it a little bit. Um, you're, you're going to be able to save room. Um, the, the disadvantage to, dis, to, to reverse grip in reducing your reach is an advantage here in home training. So, aha, we have found a, a suitable grip or a use for reverse grip. Anyway, so if we're holding this here like this, we're going to move here like this, okay? Now it's obviously, when you get to here, turn it around, come here. And this is where your orbits will come in, like that. Now. Notice that I'm not turning my center, okay? Okay, I'm not, I'm doing this, okay? So it's this motion here, and where this comes in is doing this. So this is, again, a cartwheel, like that, but it's this. Now, any, any plane of motion is also a plane or angle of resistance. So any any plane of motion that you can move in, you can also resist in that plane. And that is where power comes from. 
okay? When I move here and do this, there are systems in my body that when I hit a target here, right, my body will brace to allow that to, that force to travel through my arm into my weapon and then into the target, right? Now, if I'm doing it correctly, there's a little bit of a sway. You see this, this back and forth here. But if we imagine that we're in just like a slot for these movements, that's what's going to be there, okay? All right. So now, Tom Suma is just the straight down kind of in front of us, right? Here like this. Very, very there. It's to our somersault, right? Now, the reason why downward strikes are so intuitive and so high percentage is because of the way that our bodies are are set up okay um, everything here in front we tend it, it tends to be oh you know um, um, uh, stronger than what is in the back so we're all constant we're kind of constantly in a state of being pulled forward here like this okay this is why I tell people really work on your posterior chain, your hamstrings, your back, right? Get this, we're gonna go into this movement here in a moment, but um, because what was gonna happen is this right here always has a tendency to pull us in towards our navel, okay? We start off life like that and we kind of go that way. It's a comforting neurological position for us to do. But it's not a good mechanical position for us to be in. We want to be up, straight, chest open and relaxed okay if your chest is open it will stick out if it is tight it will it will be caved in okay what we want to do is keep this open we don't however want to force our shoulders back we just want to keep them here so we're going to slip them down our back into our back pockets and that's going to keep our shoulders right underneath our ear if we're looking right over that way and yeah so there we go okay so tonsuma is 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 very very easy for us to do because we're used there's 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 already a kind of resistance a a pull into that plane of motion for us so we can very very easily hit in downward motion. We also use gravity. Gravity is on our side in this, right? Right? Okay. Now, remember, when we're here, we are relaxed. Okay? Do not force this. We say smooth is, uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And then yeah, there's a lot of people who kind of argue with that, right? Say, no, 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 fast is fast. Yes, fast is fast. We all understand that. But what we mean is you have to get the pattern into your body so that you're very good with it first. And then speed can come. And the thing is, is speed tends to come without you trying to add it. You As long as you follow your training, you know, and I do mean follow it, right? Not lazy. You're not taking breaks when, you, when you're following and you're getting through that stuff. You will get faster. It will happen. That is what training is supposed to do. That is why we advocate all of this kind of stuff. Because it's, it's good for you. It's just like your vegetables, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. So, this downward thing, Tong Suma, is something that's going to be very, very um, easy for us to do. Now, of course, resisting, also very easy for us to do. We'll get into where this comes into the jump here in a second. Now, the last one here is our Tong Suma. Tong Suma, this right here. Now, this right here is our dynamo, our generator. Okay? In Chinese martial arts, we say the waste is the commander. Okay? And what this is going to do is this motion right here 
first of all, is one of our most powerful and mobile um, uh, uh, planes of motion that we have. Right? It's also, because it's mobile, we have to train it to resist better because it's also the plane of motion that we get injured in the most. Okay? But using this plane of motion, we can add lots, not, not just lots of speed and lots of, lots of movement, but lots of power. Okay? If we can resist in this plane of motion, we can keep our back safe, we can keep our hips safe, we can keep our whole body safe. Right? If you're two-handed, most of the stuff we're going to do here is one-handed just, just because I tend to go that way. But if you're a two-handed thing, these exercises are going to help you in the bind when you come up against somebody and you're resisting them pushing into you. Right? It may not feel like it when you're training, but trust us, um, <laughs> it's worked for us. So give it a shot. Right? Anyway, um, so... That's, um, that's there. Now, we do the exercise here where we're going around. We did that in the video, so please go and see that for detailed instructions. I'll just go through some quality checks here, right? Now, notice when I'm here. This is what I mean. I'm not doing this and then here. So watch my center. Watch my, watch my thing here. When I come around here like this, uh, we'll do this here. boom, um, here, I'm doing this. You see? My center is moving with this weapon, with, the, with my arm, okay? The slightest change in angle of the blade then moves it from one side of my body to the other. See, all I'm doing is moving it that much and then turning my body. You see? Okay, so when I come through here, same thing. I'm not going like this, boom, okay, I'm going like this. So when I'm passing my target, or I'm going in front of me like that, my center and my weapon are aligned, okay? okay? The arms are kind of helping me feel that, you see? And then... We go and you see we're using our halo orbits from shicho in here like that so it's, okay that's where this is coming in for shicho for atari and all of that kind of thing okay all right so now when we swing something like this okay we train these separately we talk about them training separately. There is zero way that you can move through three-dimensional space without, use, without moving in all three of these planes at once. It's just a matter of where our energy lies. Now, there is a little rule of thumb. You can only move or resist, well, no, not move, but you can only resist at two angles at a time. So two of these planes of motion you can resist in at a time. You cannot, so there's always going to be a third place where you cannot resist if you're resisting in two planes, okay? Now, um, in barehanded martial arts like wrestling and stuff like that, you can use that to create dynamics in your, in your opponent that you can then slip in and give them a throw or something like that. Get them resisting in two planes of motion and then attack that third, all right? Do it all the time. But anyway... <clears throat> For us, we're just kind of worried about this. Now, we don't have to use too much power, but we do have to move, okay? Now, when we start using these as spins, that's where it starts to get interesting, right? Now, I can't, of course, do 
most of these <laughs> things in here because it's just I've already hit the <laughs> hit the ceiling once. So what I'll do is I'll I'll do it kind of slowly. Hopefully we'll we'll be able to use our imaginations here um, a little bit. Um, so as I'm doing Jong Suma and I go around like this. Right. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. So as you see, when I come out here like this, I'm not doing this, right? Which is a temptation. Okay. I'm going to go through here, spin. If I want to, what I can do is I can go past here like this, then quickly come around so that I can come through a second time, right? But I must, I must cut there, right? Have to. If I don't, then I've wasted the energy that I've built up from that spin. Okay? Now, if we're using ASL, F, or ASL rule set, okay, these spins are great engagement on okay? The trick is keeping your eye on your opponent <laughs> and being able to uh, discern your target while your back is turned. Okay? Once you've got your back turned, of course, you don't have to worry about them doing anything because they are, they have, you have the priority or the right of way. But it's, they're not, just because they can't hit you in the back does not mean that they're defenseless. Okay? You still do have your back turned towards them, so it is a tricky matter of being able to make sure that they're not moving out of their space and you don't know about it. So keep that in mind. Okay, so that's kind of how that relates to um, to, to the uh, the power and the rotation. If I do ton suma, right, either bam. Right, anything like that. If I do two hands, I can do the same thing. Okay, but notice it's all the same, right? I'm coming through here. There's a little bit here. There's a little bit here, right? Okay, the angle and the direction of that force that I'm applying may be a single a single line, but in order to get that single line, I have to combine all three of these things. So that's what we always have to remember that we're doing. Okay? All right. And so on and so forth. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> that's how you're delivering power. Now, somersaults, cartwheels, jumps, flips, all of those kinds of things. If you put them at the end of a strike, right? Like I have struck and I roll, okay? What that roll allows me to do is to put the most amount of force into that downward strike and then I let it dissipate through my roll, okay? It's what we would call a sacrifice technique. Right? You are sacrificing your footing to get that in there. Okay? There's not much of a need for us to do that in reality. Um, but it is something that you can think about if you want to put some of this stuff into a choreography. Right? Um, now, if you do a, a spin or something like that before you do your strike, then you're adding force to that strike. Again, not a whole lot of reason for us to do that. We don't want to be walloping each other so that we're breaking our blades and, 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 and bending them all over the place. So, again, that's something that you're going to use kind of conceptually, but you're not you're trying not going to do it in in real life. That's why, but you're not going to get much of an opportunity to do it anyway. Um, is here. Most of this stuff is going to be coordination that you're going to be able to use, dial back um, to whatever level you guys are playing at um, there. Um, and you should always be able to do that. Don't do anything that you can't dial back. 
right? If you're doing it at the at, at your top level, can you do it medium, right? Can you do it this, that, and the other, right? As, as, as an instructor, you have to do that all the time. You have to bring, you have to be, you have to be fighting with and interacting with people of vastly different levels, right? And you have to make it worth it for them to do that. If you're just, if you go up to good people, to, to, to beginners, and you just, and you just be really fancy and, and, and do all kinds of stuff at them um, to show off, they're not going to learn nothing. Right. If you uh, if you do that with anybody, they're not going to learn nothing. Right? You always have to gauge things so that can people people can go. Now sometimes, yeah, you'll go through it. You'll do the same thing over and over again. People won't get it. <laughs> that happens all the time. But we have to be able to dial this stuff back. Now, um, so so keep that in mind. Most of this stuff is going to be done for movement sake. Right, so we're adding these 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 things to move. Um, now, we are talking about this the interaction of the points. If we talk about the frontal plane and how powerful it is, our power system pretty much is this our our hip hinge. Okay. Now we've got two ways of doing the hip hinge. If you've um, tuned in before, you probably know it is the lift and the squat. Okay. The lift, the knees stay right where they are, and the hips go back. The squat, the knees move forward and the hips move back at the same rate. Like that. Okay? Now, I can already hear grumbling about knees going beyond the toes. You don't have to worry about that. What you have to worry about is making sure that your lower leg is at the same approximate angle as your body. So as I go down here like this, here, oops, here, and there. You see? That's going to keep your weight and everything like that in your hips, out of your knees, and you're going to be all okay. Okay, so now, our power method is the lift. So, we're going like this. And if you think about a jump, what you're doing is you're going back like this. You're loading up your hamstrings. You're jumping up, and then you're squatting to decelerate yourself. Okay, so your, your, your action is your lift, reaction is your squat. If I'm receiving something, go down to a squat, all right? If I'm pushing something, I'm going to go down to a lift. I'm not going to squat. Keep those things together. Again, the same thing goes. If you're jumping to add stuff to, right, whether it's to your Dulan whether it's to your choreography or something like that, you're going, if I jump with my, with the up, up swing of my saber, I'm adding power to that swing, okay? Because my body, again, is behind it. If, however, I jump up and I come down with my saber, right, that is something that we have zero need for. But it's basically how you're going to add a lot of power. You don't need to be taught that. A child, if you go, if you go up to one of those, those sledgehammer games, right, anybody is going to go up and they're going to, ah, boo, and they're trying to jump a little bit, right? It's an intuitive thing to us, right? We want to be able to control these things and, and again, dial them back in certain areas. So you take those rotations, you take those, those things, and you apply them to the different places in your body, and you get the different physical techniques that we collectively call photography. <clears throat> so, uh, so there is that. So, so, so um, we've got that. Now... Obviously, you can't do a, um, a lot of this stuff in a small space, but you can do some of it. As I said, you can do it quite quite on gin style, and uh, not have to worry about it too much. So, all right, let's see if we've got some questions here. 
we can talk about. Um, okay, so I got some some talking here. Um, Yes, pitch, roll, and yaw movements like in aviation. Yes, yeah. Any any designation of three of the three dimensions will work. Um, as far as that. Um, and then Roberto asked again, shall and monks practice many of those movements? Don't they? I assume you mean Deton. Um Yeah, it's 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 a it's a part of wushu in the wushu uh, sport. Um, it's kind of one of the base skills because you got to learn your jumping and you got to learn your rolling and your falling, all that kind of thing. Because even even <laughs> when you wushufy a, a form, what you usually do is you take a regular form and you throw a bunch of uh, aerials, tornado kicks, and uh, uh, rolls and falls um, into it, and voila, you got your <laughs> you got your wushu form. All right, let's see. Uh, okay. Oh, Ben asks, uh, jumping attacks, are they permitted in FFE? Is that a priori violation? It is, okay, so if you can jump in, um, in FFE. If you... <laughs> If you time it to where you're landing, where, where you're landing a blow with that amount of force, um, you are probably going to be called on it. Um, but you can jump, land, and throw your throw your strike. So you don't have to um, you don't have to allow that power to go in there. And that's the thing with all of these things, right? Um, the point is not this is this is how you do it as hard as you can. This is how you can do it as hard as you need to. Right? Efficiently. Right? You use only the amount of force that you need. Um, but yeah, you can jump. And the other thing is too, as as we, we talk a lot about in ASL about the pri the, the moment of priority and, and the moments that follow. Right, but there's all this time outside of the of, of a weapons race, right? So there are all these 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 preliminary things that you can do to set things up to get people to react the way you want, and a lot of these these Ataru uh, strategies can 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 really uh, come in handy that way. Um, okay. So yeah, jumping attacks are permitted, but you got to be careful about them. Um, you don't want to look <laughs> you don't want to look like you're you're trying to win that sledgehammer game at the carnival. Right. Always got to remember these things. Um, now, some people may think that's too much to think about. I don't. We we don't have had any problem with it so. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if we got anything on the Facebooks. All right. Okay, so we got a couple of questions here. Yes. Uh, so Reisu and Ataru feel like jumping straight into the deep end. I'm still chewing on Shicho. That's fine. Absolutely. Um, take your time in these things. That, that, that's the thing. Um, the classes that I teach will almost always center around Shicho. Uh, regardless of what we're doing, um, so keep that in mind. You know that ev everything that you need to learn, um, you it is in Shicho. 
Um, and in fact, when I was in France, um, and I was doing a workshop with uh, the TPLA people there, um, we, I asked them at the end, we did some Sarasu, we did some Taru, and um, I asked everybody what form they should practice, that they could practice all of this stuff. And I told them it was one, um, Shicho. And you can find all of all the beginnings of all of these things in Shicho, right? They're just presented very, very, very simply. Right? And then you're going to add the sophistication as you as you get back up. So, all right. Okay. Um, in ASL FFE, does there have to be contact with the ground to score a point, or can the combatant be airborne? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, Again, if you are airborne and you are throwing a downward strike with two hands, expect to be given a reprimand for excessive force. Um, you do not want to do that. Um, if you're jumping toward them and or jumping away from them and you just kind of throwing a little tag um, as, as, as you're avoiding... Um, you know, uh, a strike or something like that. Maybe be very careful with it, but you don't necessarily. I, I I don't know that there's anything explicitly about being on the ground. Now, the one thing is, is that you cannot attack a fallen opponent, right? And um, that's where this is going to come in too, because um, if in in two, uh, fallen means you have three points of contact on the ground, meaning you, you're either on your knee, a foot, and a hand, two knees, and a hand, something like that, boom, you're, you're, you're falling, the person cannot, cannot hit you. Um, and if any part of your torso or head is touching the ground. Um, so, during a roll, you cannot be, you, you, you cannot be touched, right? Um, the person has to wait until you you rise, finish their attack, um, and stuff like that. Now, um, not positive if because I haven't seen them done in in competition. Not positive how rolling attacks are approached um, in 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 the game as of yet. Um, we haven't. I think I did one. Um, but almost as a joke um, with with uh, with uh, Cedric um, one time swearing with him, but um, <laughs> I mean, who knows? Um, we'll be finally finding all of this stuff out when we start getting together and we start doing these things, and we'll 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 be tweaking all of these these things to make the game um, that much more fun. But yeah, so for right now. Um, uh, if you're going to be attacking from the air, <laughs> which is, if you think you can do it, okay. Um, keep in mind that you you can very easily be called an excessive force. So always come in from the side um, and try to do it very very lightly. Um, okay. Let's see, let's talk about knee pain. That is something that has been an issue for me. So I do the Dulon and the basic sellers. Is there any tips for jumping in a way to avoid that? Okay, so um, a knee pain is, you know, often often specific. Um, but if you're getting knee pain, what that means is that the force or the energy that you're producing with your hips with your core and with your feet is getting stuck somewhere in that knee right and it's putting undue pressure on some tissue somewhere in there. um so there's unless unless i know what the specific problem is i can't give any prescriptions and even then i can't prescribe anything because i'm not a, you know, a doctor, I can give you um, experiences and things that have worked for me and have worked for clients of mine and all that kind of thing and things, and I can tell you the information um, but there. But generally speaking, 
If you have knee pain, there are two joints that you have to start attending to, and that's your hip and your ankle. Now, nine times out of 10, it's an ankle problem, um, at least here in America. Um, in, in my career as a post rehab specialist and trainer, the number of clients that I had that had a restriction in their ankle, um, in either one or both, was off the charts. Um, ankle dorsiflexion, which is the ability for your foot to move back or up, right? Like if your foot's on the ground going up like this, um, is very, very important for knee health, for your gait, for all that kind of stuff. And it's something that is um, very, very lacking in, in at least the American population, you know, around, around where I live. And from what I understand from reading, um, it's, it's pretty, pretty endemic around. Um, now, um, when I was talking about the two, the two different ways of squatting and lifting, it's the squat, which is the problem here. Okay. And when the squat's the problem, that's a problem with deceleration. And the problem with deceleration is that that's, that's where we get the most injury is in deceleration. Um, because oftentimes we are in an eccentric contraction, right? So our muscles are lengthening and then they have to quickly contract again. And a lot of people are not conditioned to that. Most people are not conditioned to that amount of thing. Now, we kicking um, is, is, is a good way of doing this. Punching, striking, all of that uh, type of thing. When I... Okay, I'm pulling this back in here. This arm is helping, right? You can't see it, but it's the same thing. And that's using, again, my Tomsuma right in there. Now, with your knees, what you want to be able to do is you want to get your squat back together, okay? So you want to do something called a face-the-wall squat. Um, I prescribe this to, you know, everybody. Um, I don't know of a, I'll try to, I don't know if I can have a good way of demonstrating it right here. Um, but I have done in the past. Uh, let me, yeah, well. Anyway, what you want to do is you want to stand up against a, and I'll just stand up. Stand up against a wall right over here. And then you're going to stand a little bit outside of your shoulder width, right? Feet turned out just a bit, okay? Just a bit. You're going to about about two or three centimeters from the from the from the wall, or an inch, inch and a half, right? Somewhere in there, okay? Inch and a half, maybe a little far. Keep it to an inch. Anyway. You've got the wall right in front of you. What you're going to do is you're going to squat down and reach between your hands and stand back up, right? Now, what the wall is going to prevent you from doing is this, is bending over too far forward. Now, this is another reason why I said ignore anybody that tells you not to let your knees go beyond your toes, okay? Because, unfortunately... Even though when you bend your knee more, it, it causes more pain usually if you have pain in your knee, um, the fact that they're not moving forward is the reason that the energy is getting stuck in that joint, right? Because your ankle needs to be able to bend. Really what your gait is is a conversation between your hip and your ankle. Your knee is essentially the telephone. And it's supposed to transmit these actions and these, these commands back and forth between the hip and the ankle. If the ankle is not involved, then you're in trouble, right? Because you don't have the thing. Also, uh, your feet cannot work really right, okay? Um, some, pro some things that contribute to this problem are athletic shoes, like running shoes, running shoes, most running shoes that have the big sole, 
you know, have a big athletic heel on them and everything like that and lots of arch support and all that kind of stuff, those shoes are terrible for you. Um, they're essentially like walking with a crutch when you don't need a crutch. Okay? And what they do is they reverse all of the actions that your foot and ankle are supposed to do because they start to push into the supports to get more support when if the support wasn't there what they would have to do is they would have to contract around your arch to firm that up rather than that so arch support i am categorically against it unless you have some medical condition that requires it um, otherwise any any shoe <laughs> i don't buy any shoe that has a that has a sole that is more than like a quarter of an inch or three quarters of an inch thick. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's too much like a platform shoe and, and, and the thing is. So the reason that is, is because what, if, if you have that big heel in there, what it's doing is it's canting you up. So you're basically, you're walking on heels. You're walking on your tiptoes all along like this, right? And so this motion, which is so important, is getting completely obliterated, right? So those shoes are probably the worst things for people to do. If you're looking for good shoes, i got great news for you because good shoes are cheap, right? They're not 120 bucks. They have them that are 120 If you like spending a lot of money on shoes, they got minimalist shoes that you can, you can break the bank on. But um, Keds, uh, uh, Converse All-Stars, Feyus, simple, flat, shoes, deck shoes, you know, that kind of thing. Um, these are where, you know, everything kind of, <clears throat> kind of comes in. So there you go. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's about it. Try to, try to keep the ankle and, and, and the knee there. We can talk about, you know, um, Specific things, you know, more directly, but um, Okay, so when you're jumping and you're getting the pain, right, you don't necessarily have to Right have to jump. Okay, if you want to You can you can do hops you can do skips, but what you but Also what you can do like if I if I'm going to do a a, a a, a tornado kick. I come in here, I'm going to mine the jump down here like this. I'm not going to leave the ground. I'm just going to get up and I'm going to spin around. Right? So I get the movement, but there's not the impact at the end. Now as I practice that, my body's going to get more and more used to that, which means I'm, it's going to be easier and easier and easier. So that when I come in through here like this, I'm going here. And then when it's finally time, and I'll move very, very soon very very low to jump around I'm not going to receive any of that of that uh, that force that was you know kind of harming me before um, okay can a jump be used to strike while still in the air thus removing the power of the strike i.e. tap the top of the head while still ascending in the jump to get around a parry. Um, well, if you're talking about the ASL rule set, um, you can't... Ugh, mm. Getting around a parry is not really in the spirit of the game. Um, <laughs> so uh, the game is supposed to go back and forth, right? So um, trying to get around somebody's parry, even though, even though you, could, you could possibly do that legally without doing a feint, um, is sort of like... Um, if, if, if people do improv, um, it's just sort of like negating your partner. Um, in, in improv, they always say you always affirm what your partner says, right? So you never disagree with them, 
you always just add to the you know because if you if you just if you just negate what the other person says then the scene ends you know you're, oh okay you know like go hey look at this fish you don't say that's not a fish you you have to go off the fish right that's the whole point right so the same thing here um you know you have your priority and and, and they parry um you know and if they get there or whatever if you have to do if you're gonna do this plus i cannot think of any scenario where you could jump and while you're ascending, drop a strike over the top of a parry without that person knowing you're doing that. Because you've got this, this, this long jump there and all of this movement and everything like that. Um, they're going to touch that thing and then you're going to get a, you're going to get a kind of a confused play. Right? Because it's going to kind of come over and it might hit, hit the blade and their head and then who knows. Um, but uh yeah i wouldn't rap shots rap shots are kind of kind of cheap anyway you know even in things like sca and stuff like that when i see people eh, eh, kind of like clawing over the top of it now granted i mean that's probably something that happened all the time but you know we're not in the business of of, of trying to re recreate reality exactly here this we're just in this to have fun all right um, worn out shoes can exacerbate ankle and knee alignment issues. Training areas with wooden floors or soft material that can help reduce the impact of the jumps. Sometimes, yes. Um, worn out shoes. Um, if you follow my advice by getting flat sole shoes, that will not be a problem. Um, or firm sole because uh, the and then if if you're getting weird wear on a on a nice flat shoe or you know minimalist shoe or whatever you can actually identify what's wrong with your gait a little bit right you say oh look at this I'm, I'm putting more weight on, on on this part of my foot here because this part's wearing out so much faster than everything else you know and and, and you can kind of do that. Um, just just get rid of so much of that shoe. I see people walking around with these freaking bricks of rubber and leather on them. And it's just, yikes. Um, you know, and they must weigh a ton, too. I can't imagine that they're light. Um, but that's just my, my type of thing. Um, okay. Is it bad to practice barefooted? It's not bad to practice barefooted. Um, bare, barefooted is, is, is great. Just make sure that your, tra your training area is clear, right? So, like, if you're training indoors and you have, like, a wooden dojo floor, something like that, that's perfectly fine, you know, bare feet and stuff like that. If you're going outside in your lawn, um, it's often best to have some sort of foot foot protection just in case you step on an errant acorn or rock or you know sharp sharp thing that somebody dropped in the dropped in the grass or something like that but other than that no i mean the whole idea of minimalist shoes is to replicate a barefoot experience um now the toe shoes um eh, those aren't as great if you're looking for toe shoes go with tabby right just the split toe right because your, your your foot works pretty much like your your, uh, your 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 big toe is is one thing and then all the other four toes are another thing right um, they don't really work independently um, the reason those toe shoes were invented were, was actually for people on sailboats so that they could have grip while still being barefoot so that they could still grab well, you, if you've ever been on a boat, you know what I mean. Um, and then people started wearing them because they were minimalist shoes and, and stuff like that. And I think some people still wear them. But, um, yeah, having the other separated toes doesn't do much for you on flat land. Um, so just go with a tabi or, or, or something like that. Um, Japanese split-toed shoe or something. Um, but, yeah, barefoot is is, is the thing. Being um, Barefoot running um, is a... 
is, is a big deal because it, it helps. Um, our, our foot is a sensor, right? And every time it lands on the ground, it's taking in information and making little changes to what we do so that we get better and better and better at it. Um, and so if you're putting, if, if you're putting a lot of stuff between you and your sensor, it's basically like, it's basically like putting, putting earmuffs on when you're trying to, uh, listen to music. Right. So, so pick your, pick your poison really right there. But anyway, okay. So, uh, let's see. Do we have any other questions here? Uh, Okay. So we only got uh, what style of kung fu do I practice? Um, I study Masha Tongbe, which is a combination of Baji, Pikwa, well Pikwa, Baji, Fanza, and uh, Choja, and some other other things, it's a Ming Dynasty type of thing. Um, so my teacher was big. The, the family, my family, very, very big in wushu circles. And so, um, if if you know wushu, you know Jet Li, uh, Ma Shenda, which is my teacher's father, was Jet Li's teacher. My teacher, of course, was you know one of the first people to graduate from Beijing University. He's got. <laughs> it's intimidating. <laughs> let's just say. <laughs> Had a lot of um, anyway, that's just an aside. All right, so if we got nothing else here for that, remember um, when you get, if you go back and look at the Ataru stuff, um, this is where it's coming from. Okay, we're trying to we're trying to just just work these rotations, right? And then when you, these all of these rotations, then when you get all of these four together, we call these our four pillars right and the first four forms when you combine all of these skills together right and you start getting into the more uh, grandiose strategy and how to combine these into ways that, that, that can um, help you in what you're trying to do that starts getting into form five um now we may do some four or five stuff so i will see uh, what uh, next week uh brings uh, we will have we'll be having classes here f I believe for the month um, before they return to uh, to live <laughs> um, we'll see when that happens um, so stay tuned for that we will be doing some zoom uh, workshops and all that kind of stuff and also I want to just put out here a little uh, tidbit uh, Monday which is Star Wars day May the 4th we here at TPLA have a very big announcement that we are going to be putting public. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, it will bring lots of uh, news and lots of good opportunities for people who might want to uh, get more involved with us and uh, for a lot of the people who have been waiting um, for us to, to, get, to get back to, to, to business as usual. Um, it won't be business as usual. It will be business as better. Hopefully, uh, something like that. Um, okay, so um, oh, we have a last minute thing. What type of gi? I do not have a gi. I have just this is a costume, a costume piece. I get most of my stuff from uh, Twin Roses um, or or friends of mine who who are seamstresses and stuff. Like that. So, there you go. Anyway, um, that is it for me. Um, I believe, I hope I got to everything here. I'll check one more time on the Facebooks. Um, I think that's it. Yep, okay. So, we will leave it there today, and I will uh, bid you farewell. Um, everybody stay safe and healthy. Wash those hands. Keep that distance. Um, 
Ataru can help you keep that distance. Start spinning around with a saber and people will back right the hell up. <sighs> right? All right. So, um, again, be safe, be healthy. Thanks for tuning in. Um, thanks for uh, sticking around with us. We will see you on the flip side. Patience, practice, perseverance. Happy sabering. <laughs>